Hi everyone, welcome to Plant Physiology. I'm so excited for this semester. This is the highest enrollment that we've ever had for this course, and I'm just so thrilled that so many students want to hear about plant physiology. We have a lot to cover this semester, but I promise it'll be really fun, engaging, and a chance to really show your creativity and personality throughout the semester. As you can see, I am not there. I'm so sorry to miss this first week of the semester, but I trust Jesse Bellamere to facilitate these first couple of meetings, and I will be back for the second week, and we can get rolling with the course material. I just want to give everyone a little bit of a background uh, in terms of my education and where I'm coming from and how that has guided my perspective or my approach to this course. So I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yes, sometimes my accent comes out very strong. I got my undergrad degree from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Go Badgers! I majored in zoology and environmental studies. And when I was an undergrad, I had an honors thesis and I worked on something completely different from what I work on now. I studied, um, it was kind of like ecotoxicology, um, it was kind of an ecotoxicology lab. And I basically studied the impacts of toxic chemicals that we find in freshwater systems and how that affects um, zooplankton. In this particular case, I worked with Daphnia magna. So if you ever get a chance to see that organism, it's really cute, so I always have a special place in my heart for um, all the little zooplankton that we see out in freshwater systems. During the summer of 2000, I had uh, an REU, which is a research experience for undergraduates, um, and that was an internship, and that was at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. This was really transformative for me. I really discovered during this particular summer that I just had to work with plants. It became the guiding force in terms of what types of research questions I actually study. So I knew, based off of my research experience at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, that I really wanted to study questions for the rest of my career that were based, um, that were really broad in scope and in scale. In particular, I really wanted to understand how the environment affects distribution of plants. Like, Why do we see certain species in this area and not in that area? What is driving uh, biodiversity in certain areas? How are invasive species impacting um, who's there and who's not there? So these are really big questions that could take years or a career to study. And that's really where what I wanted to do and that's and I figured it out at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. So I highly recommend getting a, an undergrad research experience, whether it's at Smith or, or somewhere else. So growing up in the extreme cold of Wisconsin, I decided to go to a different extreme and I started my PhD program at the University of Arizona, which is in Tucson. So that was extremely different from all of the years I spent in Wisconsin. It took me a really long time to get used to the heat, uh, scorching heat, um, but the area was beautiful, still is. It has this wonderful diversity of plants that we just don't find here. Um, and I ended up spending, gosh, 12 years of my life there doing my PhD and my postdoctoral work. And it really, as a whole, I could break it up into two pieces for my PhD work. I looked at how an invasive grass species can come into the landscape in the desert and impact the native grass species that we see there. And so what is it about this invasive grass that makes it such a great competitor? Is it that it has uh, special growth habits? Does it have a special growth rate? Is it particularly water use efficient? Does it allocate nutrients in a special way? Is it photosynthesizing off the charts? Um, and how does this make it such a great invasive plant? And so that's what my PhD was based off of. And um, yeah, so you know, and, we'll, and some of the topics that we will cover in this course are actually uh, were things I got to I got to study in this particular system and find out that yes, this particular invasive species. Um, 
was really great at kind of coming alive in the desert once rain was available and it would just get a jump start on all the other species in terms of its growth as well as um, its ability to upregulate its photosynthesis very quickly. So just those two things, the way it allocates biomass, how quickly it comes alive and grows after a rainfall, and how much it's photosynthesizing was directly linked to how well it was invading these broad landscapes in the desert and outcompeting everybody else. After my PhD, I started my postdoctoral work in the same department at the University of Arizona. And I studied how desert winter annuals are impacted by climate change. Again, this was another system that was invaded um, by a non-native species. So in this system, I was trying to understand the impacts of this desert winter annual, in particular, what, what is it doing to the rest of the natives? We had noticed that it was driving down um, diversity of the native species, but we couldn't quite figure out how it was able to take off in the first place. And we luckily we had this um, long-term data set, almost 30 years, and we were able to pinpoint, looking in the past, when it actually kind of exploded on the scene. And, and what's cool about that, it then allowed me to explore how past climate or changes in climate uh, may have facilitated its expansion in the region. We also explored other things like how nitrogen deposition might affect um, how this invasive plant is, is so prolific. We also explored um, species interactions in that maybe this invasive can like has a special relationship with certain species. And we were able to kind of figure out that that might be helping this invasive species perform so well in this arid environment. So that was a lot of fun. Um, it was, like I said, incredibly hot in the desert system. Um, I spent a lot of time working on invasive plants in these desert systems. It was a lot of fun, um, but I also wanted to try something new. And so obviously needed uh, a faculty job and of course took the job at Smith College. And I had to transform my science into thinking about trees kind of a weird concept to me, you know, that I'm having to deal with really tiny winter annual plants that may have only achieved um, a centimeter or maybe two centimeters of growth within an entire season to come to New England and deal with trees that I can't even see the top of the canopy. So that was really, a, you know, it was a, it was a great challenge and an opportunity to grow as a scientist, but it was also, um, you know, really exciting and collaborative. And um, so now I feel like I have this really broad set of skills to think about different plants in really different environments. Something you, if you haven't already heard about um, or read about, uh, is a cool project at the McLeish Field Station. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. And in this particular system, uh, I've been collaborating with Jesse Bellamere and we've had a wonderful group of students over the past seven years, seven to eight years, that have done a fantastic job with independent research projects, including honors thesis. And essentially what we are studying is the impact of losing a really important species, a foundation species, the eastern hemlock. What happens when we lose this important species as a result of these pests that we see on it. If you haven't heard about them, you'll, we will talk about it in, in great detail about how we can have two pests, the hemlock woolly adulgid, which is actually really hard to see. And the only way you kind of know that it's there is if you take your branch of your hemlock tree and turn it over and see these white tufts, these almost look like little cotton balls on the branches and that is a telltale sign that you have an eastern hemlock that has been infected with the hemlock woolly adulgid. The other pest is the elongate scale. It's actually quite common in this area and we see this really interesting 
interaction, or at least we think there's a cool interaction happening between these two pests. They are both present on the eastern hemlock trees. And you would think that this tree having two pests to deal with that uh, you'd see a really fast die off. And, and we do see a fairly, have been seeing a fairly fast die off, but uh, not as fast as we thought. So that's something you know, that'd be really cool to explore in the future. So when we lose these eastern hemlock trees, it has really big impacts for ecosystem carbon dynamics. Um, in particular, when we lose eastern hemlocks, we kind of get these big landscapes of, we call them like eastern hemlock graveyards. And what typically occurs in these areas is that we get a completely different ecosystem that takes place. And what we usually see is um, the black birch comes in, it does really well in this environment. And so rather than having an eastern hemlock forest, it has transitioned to a black birch forest. And so that is the focus of my research, understanding what, what is the impact of that big transition? What happens to the soil um, nutrient cycling? What happens to the carbon that was stored in the soil? What happens to the microbes um, that are in there which help to break down all of that litter that has been trapped in the soil. I focus a lot on carbon and so I use this machine called the Lycor 6400. I essentially strap it to my back and go hiking it at McLeish um, through the system. It's actually really hard to hike with, with this awkward heavy piece of uh, machine, um, a heavy piece of equipment on your back but it's been super useful in terms of understanding what's happening with the carbon, where is it going? And essentially what we found is that we're losing a lot of this carbon out back out to the atmosphere. So as we lose eastern hemlocks and they transition to black birch forests, a lot of the carbon that was stored in that system gets emitted back into the atmosphere as CO2. That's actually a really huge problem, right? So if we think about global warming um, and you know, adding more CO2 to the atmosphere, yes, we're gonna see some big impacts in terms of um, furthering climate change, or at least how extensive that change will be. So we've had a, a several publications on this. We've been super productive. Like I said, we've had an amazing group of students who've done some work on this system. And uh, if anyone is interested, please contact me or Jesse Bellamere. Uh, we'd love to have you um, get involved on this project and kind of see it as evolving. You know, it's there's a lot to do with it still, and I'm hoping to get grant money to do even more. Um, and and so stay tuned. Other than research, I am really passionate about being uh, an advocate and a role model for people of color. I am a Native American. My tribe is Coeur d'Alene, which is based in Northern Idaho. It's a gorgeous area of the country. I highly recommend um, you know, checking it out online if you'd like to hear more about the tribe or you can come and ask me. Um, so I really believe in being a strong role model and an advocate for all students, uh, but especially as it pertains to issues of you know, diversity and inclusion. So if anyone has any questions or concerns, please feel free to think of me as, as part of your support group if you have any issues with uh, concerning diversity and inclusion on this campus. You are all welcome to come check out the Ignace Lab online. It's ignacelab.com. And there you find some fun stuff uh, in the lab. We've we set up a YouTube channel, so that allows us to interview students and find out about their cool research or what's important to them in terms of you know, either the plant world or the science world. Um, it's basically our way of trying to disseminate really hard topics in research or science and make them palatable to the general public. We've also started to do some podcasts so and these topics range from everything about research, getting into graduate school, applying for fellowships, um, or just issues relating to what it's like to pursue a career or academics in STEM. 
So I formed the Art Science Collective at Smith College, and it actually has expanded to other people, um, and to include like a graphic designer that who works locally. I've been so excited about forming this collective because it merges the art world with the science world. And I think traditionally people have viewed those as very separate worlds and one doesn't have anything to do with the other. And I don't believe that at all. I think there's an opportunity or many missed opportunities to form unique collaborations and produce something that's beautiful and produce something that's really fun and engaging. And so a lot about this collective um, has been based on you know, taking hard topics in science or research and transforming it in an artistic way and something that's really creative and so that everyone can appreciate it in a new way and especially in a way that engages the general public. One of them was an art installation at the Botanic Garden with an art major and uh, an ESMP and biology major. That was a blast and I would love to do that again. So if you're interested in any of these avenues, whether it's YouTube videos, podcasts, or doing a fun art science collective project, um, just send me an email and we'd love to hear from you. I feel like it's important to introduce a couple of key players to the course, the teaching fellows that will be involved in this course in both the lecture and the lab. They are both Smithies, so we have Katie Wilson and we have Michelle Jackson. We do have an unofficial mascot to the course, or really all of the courses that I teach, and it's my cat, Chimichanga. So I call him Chimmy for short. He's got actually a lot of nicknames. Um, so you'll see his pictures every once in a while. He's there mostly for support when times get stressful throughout the semester. So I just want to give you an idea of what to expect in this course. What is a typical day in plant physiology? Well, it's really interactive. I think it's really fun. It's a big chance to be really creative and show your personality. Um, I do add a lot of different activities, so something that's really engaging and something that allows students to interact with, with each other, either in pairs or groups. Um, we do a lot of group discussions and group activities that involve analyzing data or thinking about hypotheses um, or drawing out graphically what is that hypothesis. So I really want to push boundaries in terms of what we think is part of the scientific process, meaning that I want to hear everyone's hypothesis, whether you think it's this wild idea or not. Um, I want to hear all the creative ideas in terms of how to run an experiment. How could you test for things? How could you test for all these special concepts or processes that we are seeing and how the environment might impact those? So we do a lot of graphs. So when we have breakout groups, um, there will be plenty of opportunities for everyone to kind of showcase their graphs to everyone else. And this meaning that this is really an, a chance to exchange all of the ideas and hypotheses. So there'll be some times when we go to the board and everyone will draw graphs. Other times it might just be explaining your cool experiment that you came up with. So I really view a typical day in this course as a chance to be creative and active in terms of how we think about plant function. I also embrace uh, small activities that are based on social media. And this actually ends up being really fun. It's something I came up with last year and basically it always left me giggling and finishing class um, in this kind of happy state. So on Mondays, we have Monday meme day. So students will leave having created uh, an original meme um, that summarizes an important topic or the entire lecture of that morning. We also have midweek tweet. So again, this is an original tweet, um, also complete with images that uh, summarize concepts from that day's lecture. So it ends up being really fun. These small exercises like this are what you can expect from the course. 
So I'm not going to read the course syllabus and the course schedule today. It's there for you to look over. I'm happy to answer any of your questions um, via email uh, or we can schedule an appointment and we can go over it together as well. I just want to thank everyone for taking this course. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and I'm so excited to get to know all of you. So I will see you in the second week of the semester.